Hello, this is Darren Pulsifer, Chief Solution Architect of Public Sector at Intel, and welcome to Embracing Digital Transformation, where we investigate effective change leveraging people, process, and technology. On today's episode, training the next generation in AI with special guest Pete Schmidt. Pete, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Darren. Glad to be here. Pete and I have a, a sordid history <laughs> working at Intel together. But Pete, tell us what a little bit about what you've been up to and uh, your background. Sure, glad to. So uh, for many years, I worked at Intel as an account executive, helping out the uh, Department of Defense, figuring out which of the Intel technologies could be useful to help them advance their mission. So after a, a very wonderful tenure working with many people, um, I retired from Intel at the end of last year, and I've been focusing on continuing the volunteer work I've done as part of the Defense Industries Consortium called AFSIA. That's the Armed Forces Communications and Electronics Association. My role in the San Diego chapter has been to help STEM students, right, science, technology, engineering, mathematicians, to develop a love and pursue a career in STEM that might wind up aiding uh, US-based defense, but it might not. Uh, so it's been uh, good work. And I've, I've taken the interest that I've developed over the years in artificial intelligence and begun to, to teach the students because in their work as uh, robotics competitors, especially at the high school level, they need to use autonomy in their competition. So I thought perfect place to educate them on this technology for their competition and for use in the future. So I, I think it's wonderful, Pete. What, I mean, this volunteer because you're you're building you're building the next generation of entrepreneurs and scientists that are going to extend this incredible field of of artificial intelligence that we're starting to see now. I think I think that's great. Thank you for for doing that. Yeah, that's terrific. They're just uh, amazing kids. Uh, and, you know, they have such incredible interest and capabilities. Uh, that's been wonderful to see them absorb. I mean, I've worked with many uh, amazing technical customers over the years, and I can just feel these students uh, being on the cusp as being that next generation of implementers. They're, they're oh, hungry that, and thirsty. That, yeah. That's great. That must keep you young. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. So, You've you've had some time to focus on exactly. artificial intelligence over this last uh, seven eight months that you've been retired. What have you found? Well, I've found that there's a real need for people to understand uh, a little bit better how this technology works. That was what was driving me to understand so I could explain it. Right? There's a lot of fud, a lot of hype, concern. Is it going to take over our future? Is it going to be embedded in our brain? So having been exposed to Intel's efforts in artificial intelligence uh, and having a head start, I thought, well, I'm going to dive in and learn myself how it works. And what better way to figure out what I know and what I don't know than by explaining it to these students? Well, that's, you know, that's what they say. The best way to learn something is to teach it. Exactly. So, all right. So what, so what have you found? What, uh, what, what was kind of eye opening for you? Well, let me uh, just give you a representation of who these students are, and that might help to, uh, you know, shed a little light on, on, uh, you know, the appetite. So can you see okay. this uh, screen? No, not yet. Did you hit share? I think I did. Let me try it again. All right, now it's coming through. Okay. All right, there we go. All right. So this is a group of uh, high school students, uh, in this case from uh, San Diego High School. But this robot that they're standing in front of uh, operates uh, against a set of rules in a competition. And part of this is to use autonomy. And the autonomy portion, in this case, uses computer vision. So... I thought, well, I'm going to help these students with, an, with a possible architecture 
uh, in their autonomy portion, right? They use QR codes for positional information to determine where is the robot to help navigate it to pick up an object, et cetera. So I thought, well, I'll explain to these students how this capability is currently being used in the defense world. So I took for them uh, and described an example of the DARPA Sea Hunter Unmanned Surface Vehicle. This is uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency's Continuous Trail Submarine. It's a trimaran, or no, it, it's a vehicle to trail submarines continuously is the idea. It's a 132-foot vessel that has an outrigger on each side that's completely unmanned, and it uses radar and cameras to implement its self-piloting capability. It can go up to 10,000 nautical miles wow. and operate up to 21 knots. So when a camera is looking out from the bow of this device, of this vessel, it's very similar to the student's robotics. And how they spot threats, uh, obstacles, things that they need to uh, investigate or, or steer away from is based on computer vision, based on artificial intelligence. So I took them through the idea that in artificial intelligence, you are gathering a lot of data, right? This could be structured data, it could be unstructured data, but it's all being used to make predictions using a model based on training data. And this capability, the concept of machine learning has been around for a long time, but it's evolving so quickly that they have been born just at the right time in history to be able to ride this exponential increase in technology as it's coming together because there's a convergence of the latest capabilities of math, data, silicon, and programming. They're really unleashing all kinds of world-changing possibilities. So are, are you seeing that these um, high school students, are they stepping up to it? Are they able to understand? Because this is really complex stuff, right? It really is. It, is. is it still too complex for a high school student to grasp it? Or well, the, neat, the neat thing about these teams, Darren, is that they want to be very inclusive in gathering uh, team members of all capabilities. So of course, you're going to have the programmers that can grasp and implement this technology, but you have mechanical engineers to design the system. You have marketing students to let folks know uh, about the capabilities of the team. You have operational folks to help uh, implement the logistics. So I'm finding that the uh, computer programming uh, students on the team are already well into this capability and very open to, uh, and passionate about how they can use this technology especially the math portion. I thought that was particularly interesting to figure out, gosh, I took a lot of linear algebra and calculus in college uh, for my engineering degree. How is that used? It turns out that in artificial intelligence, linear algebra and calculus are widely used because you need to use matrix multiplication, for instance, in the case of convolutional neural networks for computer vision to figure out and detect what is in the image that I'm detecting or, or seeing in my camera. So finally, we can tell our kids, you're learning this because you're actually going to use it. <laughs> How many times have you heard, I'm never going to use this? Yeah, all well, the time. The case. <laughs> well, I think it's awesome because these kids actually get to learn a couple things. First off, that what they're learning in school is valuable and they're learning. I mean, artificial intelligence, they're, they're standing on the shoulders of um, 50, 60 years of research in this space that they they could just take for granted. Oh, yeah, it works fine. I I think it's wonderful for them to have that without having to go through all the pain and turmoil that um, the industry's already gone through. That's really true. And to open their eyes to the fact that, like you just said, it's been around for 50 years or so that folks have been trying to learn from data. But now with the silicon capabilities and the programming capabilities that exist, 
it's being accelerated to the point where structured data that had to be labeled very uh, laboriously, uh, you know, that's a great way up to this point, but the doors are opening up to this new generation of artificial intelligence where unstructured data can be used. Un, you know, su Semi-supervised learning can be used to, to remove the, the, the burden of, I'm gonna label one image at a time with, is that a raccoon or a monkey to determine you know, in my picture, what is this uh, item that I'm seeing? So, so because uh, advancements in technology and silicon, frankly, I mean, the silicon's a lot faster now, so we can do a lot more. Right. These students were able to take advantage of the of these really high tech things much easier. The the barrier to adoption is a lot lower uh, than it than it has been even four years ago. That's really true. I mean, take the case of the students; they have a certain budget that they cannot spend more. Uh, than the allocated amount to build their system, right? Otherwise it would be like the world of competitive sailing. You just throw money at it or <laughs> yeah. and to build the best boat you can. And it's just not fair. So the students have a budget where maybe they've got a couple hundred dollars to spend on the accelerators that they might use. It really forces them to learn the intricacies of AI to figure out, right, what really is the latency that I need to navigate autonomously uh, and get an accelerator uh, proportionally uh, priced, right? Or maybe use just the capabilities of the CPU to do that. So it's a, well, it's a good I, real word exercise. Yeah, I like that because it's a real world, right? We don't right. have unlimited right. budgets, um, even though we'd like to have unlimited budgets. We don't have them. Um, and there are power constraints and size, right? You can't hook your autonomous robot up to the cloud um, and have all your data processing happen in the cloud, right? That that just doesn't work uh, as well. So I, it sounds like a great program. It's fantastic. And it really is a platform and an opportunity to open their eyes to, okay, you've got this project you're working on, but as you pick your path in education and decide, what do I want to do when I you know, graduate from college? What do I want to study to help get there? The types of questions that you can answer using AI and deep learning uh, are much broader, right? In other words, in the autonomy world, you might just be asking, you know, what, what is that object out there? Is it what I'm looking for? What should I do? But in the broader scale, you can go from just detection to maybe you want to decide, I want to categorize a bunch of images. I might want to predict an outcome. Uh, maybe I want to make a recommendation based on the data that I'm seeing. Uh, maybe I want to generate new context, content. And these can be used in a variety of applications. In healthcare, for instance, you can use it to maybe uh, detect cancer, assisting uh, an oncologist with identifying uh, an object that maybe would be missed or should be uh, looked at more deeply. Or in the retail world, maybe you want to you know, target ads based on what a user has in their shopping cards correlated with what you have in inventory, correlated with the highest margin uh, product you want to present to them in, the, in their shopping uh, exercise. It, it, so it sounds like it's on, um, AI is kind of unleashing a whole, a whole myriad of new business cases, business use ca um, opportunities. Um, in, instead of it getting rid of jobs, it actually may create several, several new ways of, of doing business. That's really true. And it's not just for the folks that are the developers, the scientists, or the engineers, because to answer these complex questions might take the insight or the perspective of a business person or a marketer or a data analyst. So the doors are opening for all kinds of uh, work roles uh, to use AI, not just the technical folks that can digest the nuts and bolts. So, so this brings up a, an interesting question around generative AI, because you re, you retired right when Gen AI just kind of blew up, November right. of 2023. No, we're in 2023 now. 2022, November of 2022, Gen AI, Open Open AI's Chat GPT came out and took the world by storm. What really have you, What have you seen over the last six seven months? 
what has that done with the kids that you're teaching and in the industry as a whole? What, what's your perspective on that? Well, it's been fascinating because first I offer them a comparison between, well, what was being used before that? Convolutional neural networks were mimicking the functionality of the brain, right? They had multiple layers, they had perceptrons, all these layers and perceptrons were connected. Input was fed into this convolutional neural network, weights are assigned, feedback was generated until you got the output that you had hoped for. You compare it to the input and calculate the loss, right? That's a neural network using labeled input. Now, the and that was great for image classification, object detection, maybe speech recognition. And that uses the, uh, you know, the, the mathematical uh, functionality of a matrix multiplication. Uh, a lot of pre-trained models exist out there. So folks are not starting from scratch. They can use transfer learning to take image recognition capability and decide, okay, I'm gonna keep a couple layers and now change subsequent layers uh, to detect that particular item that I'm looking for that's different than what it was trained on. Right. But with transformers and, uh, and, and generation and generative AI, uh, the real breakthrough was in finding patterns between elements mathematically uh, that exist over a long range. You've got a long stream of data coming in, but you want to draw information from this whole stream of data or this whole image. So you use positional encoding. So the model that came out, uh, the mathematical model uh, uses normalization layers, residual connections, and it's resulted in a number of amazing uh, new capabilities, right? Not only the generative pre-trained transformer models, right, the GPTs, but also BERT, the bi-directional encoder representation from transformers. There are vision transformers, the, the VIT is a model, and the one of the latest ones is called the Megatron Turing Natural Language Generation. Now, the real interesting thing is that these models would not have been possible to train and use without the advent of the latest capabilities, right? It takes millions of dollars, billions of petaflops to, chain, to train these models that can now be used. And folks are wanting to use these capabilities for things like drug discovery. If we can predict the shape of a protein and its consequent functionality, we can accelerate the time to produce and personalize new medicines, for instance. It's just fantastic. So I, it, so it is a game changer. That's what I'm hearing. It absolutely is. Do, do you, do you think that, um, I, I know there's always a watershed moment in different technologies, even if gener even if chat GPT is not the most complex or most um, capable technology out there, it changed the world. Because it now possibilities. Absolutely. Yeah. In, in yeah. People are now be thinking beyond, Oh, AI is doing object detection because that's what people were thinking AI was was good for. And and more people are interested, which means more money is being dumped into it. How where do you see things put on your, you know, get your crystal ball out and talk into the students, the art of the possible. Where do you see things going um, in the next five years as far as AI and uh, the way it, it can change uh, education or or any industry? Well, I ask the students to take a look at, you know, I give them their first dose of, of business insight. This may be really cool. It might make a wonderful video game, but when you get out into the real world, you have to ask yourself, does this offer the capability to make a company money or save a company money? And that, of course, as you can see, uh, the promise and the hype of this has driven up uh, valuations in the stock market. Folks expect that the future earnings of companies are going to increase because AI is going to improve their ability to reduce costs. Will it replace employees? I don't think so. I think it will make them more productive. It will free them to be more creative. 
Will it allow companies to make more money? I think you're going to see a combination of companies that can either use the technology to improve their revenues and their income, or it will allow customers or companies to be born that will disrupt those companies. They will be born without the shackles of existing processes and infrastructure uh, and can use AI uh, to build new business models. So examples of those business models could be in, uh, in coding, right? I've got uh, students that write a lot of code. I asked them, how would it be if you could use AI to generate the first pass of your code? And then you could complete the code. Very interesting to them. I mentioned life sciences, uh, use in drug discovery or in chemistry. Uh, translation, boy, how about the language gaps that exist in cultures around the world? Real-time translation is possible to use, or possible to do with these large language models. Well, in, in fact, I don't know if you know this, Pete. I, I have another podcast that does the weekly news in digital oh, okay. transformation, and right. I produce it in six languages. Oh, boy. <laughs> and I don't do translation. I have a generative AI do the translation, and I have native speakers in those countries review it and then read for me. Um, and before, when I looked at doing it, it was going to cost me substantial amount of money to do the translations. Now, um, literally, it takes an hour's worth of someone's time that's a native speaker to read through the script and read it. And it's it's one it it it's, it's opened up new doors. So I, I see exactly where you're going with that. Right. So the other thing that I let my students know is where are the centers of excellence that exist in uh, developing these new innovative technologies? Of course, they're with companies like Intel that develop silicon that have accelerating instructions built into the CPUs or that have GPUs available for data center or end users. But they also exist in some of the software companies. So for instance, the, uh, the transformer model itself, I let them know that came out of a Google brain initiative in 2017. Uh, the concept of stable diffusion, which is uh, generating high quality detailed images that came out of Stanford. Maybe you want to go to Stanford and uh, do some work there. Uh, and then other uh, technologies that are on the cusp now are something called a neural radiance field, the NERF. Uh, this is gonna be really applicable in autonomous navigation and robotics. You'll be able to generate 3D content from 2D images coming out of industry. So all kinds of places uh, that I've tried to raise their awareness where this work can be done and furthered using their talents. I, I think that's wonderful because you're showing them AI is not over, it's just starting. It really right. is. And, and over the horizon, there's this concept that's being talked about called artificial general intelligence, right? Different than just artificial intelligence, but the general intelligence portion is the idea that down the road, you might be a part of developing or using something called a, a generalizable embodied agent. And this is an agent that can adapt to new conditions. It can handle high dimension or complicated data distributions using underlying technologies like neural operators to understand multiple domains, like perhaps you want to mix image and text and scientific all together. I think that's going to be on the next uh, wave of, of innovation. Um, a very, very, uh, very disruptive. It Absolutely. In fact, it feels, I, Pete, you, I, I'm sure you remember um, the early 90s when the internet started just taking off. I mean, the internet had been around for how many years? Decades before right. the 90s when people started getting in their homes and email was starting to take off. It feels to me like this is in the same boat as that. It really is. And, and you're going to have some friction, some, some barriers to adoption. So when you come up with a great new use case, you've, you've gotten your data, you've identified the problem you want to solve, you figured out 
which model am I going to start with? That has got to mix with the infrastructure, the capabilities, the people, the culture that already exists in the company that's going to use it, right? You and I have uh, worked on great projects that involve enterprise compute architecture. And the architecture that's going to host this AI innovation is much is similar uh, in that it's going to have a goal of, all right, how am I going to develop this, test it, store it, uh, iterate it, uh, you know, check the value and, and the, and the, and the, and the, you know, how accurate it is. I, I've got to be able to explain it. Uh, when this model is running, I've got to match that uh, to my environment. If it's on a very low power autonomous system, I can't just put a big 300 watt GPU out there. I might need a low power FPGA. So all these things need to be considered when you're going through the development cycle of getting ready to deploy that model. I think that's where the ecosystem is very interesting. Now you've got all kinds of folks out there that are uh, figuring out how to specialize from an innovation perspective. Uh, am I gonna be uh, a company that provides tools across the whole spectrum, like the cloud service providers? Right. Because these have to match with the infrastructure. So maybe you're gonna piecemeal uh, your data analytics portion. Maybe you're gonna piecemeal your experiment management portion to try and build and evolve this environment where these students, once they've been educated and trained, can go to work and be, be really productive in delivering this capabilities. Well, well, that that's another question I have um, is we need to we need to in the industry make sure that we have the environment so the new workers that are coming in can hop on to these new technologies, can be innovative, that we don't I love I love the word when you said earlier, shackle them down with old processes and old ways of thinking, we need to unleash the, the power of, of, of these new um, engineers, business leaders, marketing uh, people uh, to, to think outside of the traditional boxes that, we, that we've been dealing with for, for so long. That really is true. And I think that's why you've seen the rise to prominence of some of these companies like, like a Snowflake, for instance. This is going to be a specialized capability and product to be able to manage your data. Uh, maybe a, a Tecton or a Hopsworks, for instance, uh, enables you to do feature management in your development pipeline. Uh, your operations, as you and I have worked together before on Databricks, but has a whole lot of other company there like Heavy AI or Data Robot. Maybe you want to have a tool to label your data. You might use something like Labelbox or scale or Appen, all kinds of uh, technologies exist out there that have to be put together to fit with your environment, your capabilities, and the objective that you're trying to accomplish. So it, it sounds to me like we're not being replaced <laughs> at all. There's a lot of work to be done still. I think that's the, you know, the onus is on us, Darren, to figure out ways to enable our, our students, our customers, to really solve these hard problems, whether it's in robotics or video analytics, healthcare, uh, public sector and public safety, media, entertainment, genomics, uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, or internet services, all offer terrific opportunities to solve amazing problems. It's really a, an exciting time going forward. I, I, I think so too, very, very excited. I'm not scared at all, um, I'm admit. excited. Um, but Absolutely. I also know this, you, you you either evolve or die. Um, and so I, I'm trying to educate everyone, jump onto this bandwagon because this is going fast. So uh, exciting stuff. Pete, thanks for coming on the show. Um, I love the perspective of the next generation of um, of leaders that you're training up. Thank you for obviously helping helping the industry as a whole with that. My pleasure, Darren. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you for listening to Embracing Digital Transformation today. If you enjoyed our podcast, give it five stars on your favorite podcasting site or YouTube channel. You can find out more information about Embracing Digital Transformation at embracingdigital.org. Until next time, go out and do something wonderful.